All right, well, our understanding and uh, view of the world, at least in part, is culturally determined. Uh, we see and interpret things through the lenses of our own time and place, and, uh, and that can have a positive effect, uh, but it can also have a negative effect. And on the positive side, it means that we can sometimes clearly see things that people from the past couldn't see with the same clarity in their own time. And so one example of that is the way that uh, black people were uh, treated during times of uh, slavery or Jim Crow or something like that. And uh, today we can very clearly see the injustice and the, the cruelty of how they were treated. And yet the uh, people who lived during that time, even uh, people who considered themselves to be uh, Christians at that time, often didn't see it with the same clarity with which we see it. And so why is that? Well, it's because people in the past uh, had some cultural blinders, right? They were people of their time, and the cruelty and the injustice was sort of culturally acceptable. So uh, again, they didn't see it. And there are these limitations and these biases that we have in our cultural perspectives that uh, present or that uh, prevent us rather from seeing things clearly. And we all have these. Uh, we all have these biases and these presuppositions that shape our understanding of the world. And uh, again, sometimes it can benefit us when we look at uh, other cultures and we see ways that uh, Christians in other cultures or at other times might not have uh, seen things as clearly in their cultural context, but it can also work against us, right? Because we all have these cultural blinders that hinder us from seeing things the way they truly are. Uh, this is one of the reasons that it's helpful to read books written by dead guys, right? So in our uh, small group on Thursday night, we we're reading a book that was written 100 years ago. And uh, people who lived 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 300 years ago or whatever, they didn't have our cultural blinders. They had their own set of cultural blinders, but they didn't have our specific set of cultural blinders. And they can often speak to our current context and help us to see things that we might not see because of our cultural context. Uh, they can address modern issues with a clarity that we might lack because their perspectives are, uh, at least at times, untainted by the current cultural biases. And, and uh, moreover, this principle holds true cross-culturally today. So as uh, Christians living in the United States, we might notice a, a certain practice in some other culture uh, amongst Christians in that culture that's out of step with the gospel. So you can imagine... Uh, the, the gospel's going forth in some culture where uh, pagan religion is widely practiced and uh, maybe Christians in that cult culture are incorporating some of the pagan rituals into their Christian worship. So, you know, in some cultures there's this uh, thing known as ancestor worship where, um, you know, the, the people might present offerings and prayers to deceased relatives. And... Um, and they, maybe they believe that their ancestors can influence things in the here and now, but, but if they're incorporating some of that into their Christian worship, obviously uh, we could look at that and recognize that, that doing that is a problem. And so uh, all of this is to say our cultural perspective can help us to avoid certain things that people in other places might not be able to see. Uh, but again, we ourselves are not immune from this, and... Um, because this is true, because I understand this, uh, when I encounter Christians from other cultures at times, I've actually asked them the question. So I've asked this question uh, a handful of times. I've asked Christians from other cultures, what would Christians from your culture say to Christians in our culture about how we might be getting it wrong? And every time I have asked that question, I've gotten the same answer uh, from Christians in different cultures. Uh, when Christians from other cultures look at Christians living in America, the, the correction that they will most frequently offer, at least according to my anecdotal um, experience of having asked the question a handful of times, uh, the, the, the correction they most frequently offer is directed at our wealth and our materialism. And uh, Christians from other uh, cultures would tell us that we don't need all of the stuff. And uh, 
Christians from less affluent areas of the world uh, live with far less than we do, and yet they're not unhappy, they're not dissatisfied, they're, they're content, because ultimately, as Christians, our uh, contentment and joy and satisfaction is found in Christ, right? And so uh, Christians from other cultures, they can see that our pursuit of wealth and comfort and material things can become an idol, and it can lead us away from a wholehearted dependence upon Christ. So uh, if all of that is true, then we need to uh, pay particular attention to our text for this morning. So let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 5 and 6. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. And uh, of course the, the Christians to whom the author of Hebrews was writing Uh, They didn't live in an affluent culture like modern American Christians, but uh, they still faced significant temptations related to wealth and material possessions. Uh, The original readers of the book of Hebrews were tempted to turn back to Judaism. They were Jewish Christians. They were tempted to return to Christless Judaism in order to avoid the social pressure that was uh, being imposed upon them by the broader Jewish community. And uh, obviously part of the problem with being socially ostracized is the financial hardship that it brings. Uh, They're in the situation where their own people were in some level shunning them. And and so that makes it difficult to engage in trade and commerce and to do business and things like that. So uh, for some of them, returning to Judaism Uh, seemed like a viable option because by uh, rejoining the broader Jewish community, they could alleviate the social pressure and regain access to business and trade. And uh, they might be motivated in that by a love of money. So the author of Hebrews writes to warn them about, and I think it's a warning that's uh, especially relevant for us. So uh, the author says this, this is Hebrews 13, beginning of verse 5. He says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So he says, uh, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. So we need to be uh, content with our current financial status. In, uh, in our culture, people are engaged in a continual pursuit for more. And so, you know, we pursue higher incomes, better possessions, greater wealth. And uh, with each step we make along the ladder, we think, okay, well, if I just get to this next point, then I'll be satisfied. If I, uh, if I just have this thing, then I'll be happy, right? But Uh, When we get the thing, the happiness lasts for like, you know, a whole five minutes before then we're on to the next thing. And so we need more money, we need a nicer home, a nicer vehicle, nicer things, and and that cycle just repeats itself so that we're never content with where we are currently. And and obviously that's nothing new, right? This is uh, uh, something that has been around for a long time. And, and, And you would think that, okay, well, since it's been around for such a long time, we would recognize that the next thing on our list of things to acquire isn't going to bring us the happiness that we think it'll bring. Well, you know, it's because the fallen condition of the human heart creates idols. Uh, The fallen human heart sets up things that we believe will give us meaning and satisfaction, but those things uh, don't satisfy. Those things leave us feeling empty. They don't deliver on their promises. And uh, this idea that we can be satisfied by material things is actually a deception. It's a lie uh, that keeps us ensnared in this perpetual state of uh, discontentment. And so uh, the author of Hebrews here, he gives us uh, a solution to this problem. He says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. So that's that's a command, right? Uh, Keep your life free from the love of money. And It's a command that is rooted in the very wisdom of God because God obviously knows. He understands that money doesn't satisfy human beings. He knows that material possessions don't deliver on their promises. And and not only does God know that material things don't satisfy, he knows that we can only find true joy and satisfaction in him. And we actually uh, see that in the reason that the author 
of uh, the book of Hebrews gives us here for keeping our lives free from the love of money. Notice the author says, he says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. Well, why? He tells us, he says, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? So uh, God will never leave you or forsake you if your faith is in Christ. You can't lose your salvation if your faith is in Christ. God will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And this is the foundation for true contentment. Uh, True contentment, the author says, doesn't come from the accumulation of wealth. A true contentment comes in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that nothing can take from us. A true contentment is found in the Lord who will never leave us or forsake us. Uh, contentment is found in Christ. And that means that if you want to be content, you have to recognize that the Lord Jesus is sufficient. Our security and our satisfaction and our peace and our joy, none of that comes from what's in our bank accounts, right? It's not based on our financial status. It's not based on the stuff that we have. And it's not as though uh, we would have everything we need if we just had a little bit more, right? We have everything that we need for everlasting joy in Jesus Christ. And Christ will never leave us or forsake us. Uh, And so we have every reason to be completely content. Uh, Of course, the world tells us that our worth is measured by things like our wealth or our things. Uh, The world tells us that there's security in having a lot of money in in the bank. Uh, The advertisers of this world, those guys spend billions of dollars trying to uh, convince us that we could be happy if we just bought a little bit more of what they're selling us, right? But God's word exposes that for what it is. And the author of Hebrews exhorts us to flee materialism and to seek the contentment that can only be found in Christ. So uh, be content with your current financial situation because again, uh, contentment isn't dependent upon your bank account, uh, the balance in your checking account, your investments, your salary, the stuff you have. Uh, According to the author of Hebrews, contentment is rooted in the promise that we have the Lord in our lives and he will never leave us or forsake us no matter what. No matter what our situation might be, that promise is true. So we need to to trust the Lord. And and so we need to be content with our current financial status. Uh, When he tells us to be content with what we have, obviously he's talking about uh, contentment with what we currently have. And, uh, and so whatever, situ- whatever your situation might be at the current moment, uh, that's what he's talking about. That's where you want to be content. And, and you can actually ask yourself the question, right? Can I be content in this if my situation never improves? Or uh, if it doesn't get better, am I simply going to be discontent for the rest of my life? I mean, there are places in the world where there are people who are hardworking and maybe financially wise, but they live in poverty. Right? And so uh, what if your situation doesn't improve? What if it doesn't get better for your children or your grandchildren? Uh, can we be content with what we have now? Uh, or uh, can we be content if things get worse? Because that's what the Lord is calling us to do. And uh, obviously discontentment can lead us away from the Lord. It's uh, it's, it's actually true in a lot of different areas, not just finance. You know, we need to be content in our finances, but we need to be content in our relationships and in a lot of other areas. But, but you can imagine that if you're not content, that you might be tempted to seek that contentment apart from Christ. Uh, you can see how it would be tempted, uh, tempting rather to abandon the pursuit of Christ if you became occupied with the idea that there was something else out there that could satisfy you. And so, you know, if it's an extramarital affair, you'll pursue that. If it's methamphetamine, you'll pursue that. And if it is money and material things that are the answer, you'll pursue that. And um, the problem is, of course, if you're pursuing any of those things, you'll need to make certain sacrifices. And one of the things that you'll need to sacrifice is your pursuit of Christ, right? Uh, Jesus, uh, he says, you cannot love God and money. Right? And uh, if you want to pursue something else for your happiness, you'll need to sacrifice things like uh, time. It takes time 
to pursue your happiness in other things. And so you'll need to sacrifice time in God's word. You'll need to sacrifice fellowship with the body. You'll need to sacrifice your commitment to your family and the Christian mission and and on and on. Right? So uh, avoid the love of money. Be content with what you have because um, what you really have is Christ. And he will not leave you or forsake you if your faith is in him. Uh, Continuing in verse 6, the author says, So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So uh, we have Christ in our lives, and since he will not leave us or forsake us, we can say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Uh, The Lord is our helper. It's almost exactly the same thing that the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, right? If God is for us, who can be against us? It's that same idea. The Lord is our helper. And so, you know, you can imagine for a minute that you're back in middle school. And, uh, or maybe you are in middle school, so you don't have to imagine or think very hard about it. But, but you're on the playground, and there is a school bully who likes to beat you up. So he punches you one day, he pushes you down in the dirt another day, and he's just a bully. And uh, as a result, you try to avoid the bully, right? You stay close to the teacher at recess. Uh, You might hang around after school to help one of the teachers. And then when the coast is clear, you sort of slip out the back door and you you try to avoid uh, this kid who's bullying you. Um, but, But then you can imagine that a new kid comes to school. And uh, this new kid is built like an NFL linebacker. And uh, not only is he huge, but he knows how to wrestle. He knows how to box. He knows jujitsu. He can uh, literally take any kid in the school. And, uh, and so imagine that over time, you build a friendship with this, this new kid. And uh, the two of you become best friends. You become inseparable. You go everywhere together. Uh, the question then becomes, OK, well, are you scared of the bully anymore? And obviously, no, you're not scared of the bully because the bully is not going to touch you anymore, right? Because he doesn't want to tangle with your best friend. And if that's true in the the school playground scenario, how much truer is it for those whose faith is in Christ? Because the almighty God, the God who upholds the universe by the word of his power, he is our helper. He is the one that helps us. And if the Lord is our helper, we need not be afraid because if the Lord is in your corner, who can come against you? Right? There's no one. What can man do to you, the author says. And so we have no reason for fear. We have no reason for insecurity or anxiety or trepidation, uh, except that we lose sight of that. And so if you find yourself fearful, if you find yourself uh, struggling with anxiety or insecurity, this is actually the answer to that to that problem. This is how you avoid fear and insecurity. And, and it's really important because when you're insecure, that actually leads to all kinds of other problems. Uh, when you're insecure, it makes you uh, overly sensitive. It makes you easily offended. Uh, when we are insecure, we become preoccupied with trying to validate ourselves. We uh, seek reassurance from others. And And that sort of heightened level of sensitivity makes us more prone to interpret certain things that people do as personal attacks. So, you know, maybe you've known someone like this, someone who is always asking you about some interaction that you might have had with them, uh, someone who is always wondering, hey, man, are you mad at me? Is something wrong? And and nothing's ever wrong. And uh, people... I do get mad, that happens, and uh, interpersonal conflict is real, but there are people who are always worried that you're uh, upset with them, and you're never upset with them. And in fact, you only uh, might start to get upset with them because they always think you're upset with them, right? That's the upsetting thing. Uh, And that's insecurity, right? Uh, And when you're insecure, you become defensive. Uh, when we were at the uh, Ironman Summit in uh, January, one of the speakers, uh, Brett Laird, he actually he mentioned this verse, and he, he said this. I wrote this down in my notes. He said, uh, insecure men are fearful men, fearful men are fragile men, fragile men are fickle men, and fickle men are faithless men. And that's absolutely true. All of those things go together. That is the progression. Uh, insecure 
men and women are fearful men and women. That's where insecurity comes from, right? It comes from fear. And if you're afraid of what people think about you, if you're afraid that people won't like you or that they uh, won't think that you're smart or that they won't think that you're pretty, right? That's insecurity and it's grounded in the fear of man. It's grounded in a fear of what people think. Uh, here the author says that if we understand that the Lord is our helper, we will not fear. And our attitude will be, what can man do to me? But uh, uh, insecure men are fearful men, and fearful men are fragile men. So uh, they're, they're in a constant state of anxiety. It makes them emotionally vulnerable. Uh, fearful men are fragile men because their constant fear leads them to sort of heightened state of sensitivity where any comment or action or situation is perceived as some sort of a threat, right? And, and, and this makes it so they're easily hurt, they're easily offended over very minor issues, and, and so they need constant reassurance, they need constant validation, and any perception of criticism or conflict leads to deeper anxiety because Again, that threatens their sense of security, and their sense of security is already sort of teetering on the edge anyway. Uh, again, this can lead to defensiveness, it can lead to withdrawal, it can lead to overreaction, and that, uh, that fear really undermines their ability to, to confront life's challenges in a way that is uh, good and biblical. Uh, insecure men are fearful men, fearful men are fragile men, and fragile men are fickle men. Uh, which makes complete sense, right? Because if you need this constant reassurance and validation and you're not getting it, that's going to create a lot of instability in your emotional well-being. And if there are these perceived slights and perceived criticisms and maybe someone's not paying enough attention to me and I'm constantly getting upset about things, uh, that's why fragile men are fickle. They're driven by their feelings, and their feelings are all over the place. And so uh, they're, they're unreliable, and maybe they change jobs frequently because one coworker does something that upsets them or, um, you know, whatever it is. And so uh, if a person lacks stability in his or her life, it may be grounded in this insecurity and fear and fragility that comes from not trusting the Lord. Uh, which brings us to the final point, uh, fickle men are faithless men. Right? Faith is the solution to this entire progression. Because again, if you understand that the Lord is your helper, well, what can man do to you? If you understand that you have eternal joy in Christ, that nothing can take away from you because Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and was raised on the third day to give you new life, then you needn't be afraid. You needn't be fearful. You, you needn't be insecure because you have the confidence that the Lord is using all of the difficulties for your good and his glory. And, and so you can navigate the challenges of life biblically with much greater proficiency. So uh, when we think about fighting against the love of money, uh, when we think about coming out against insecurity and fear, the solution is the gospel. The, the solution is the relationship that we have with the Lord uh, through what Jesus has done in his life, death, and resurrection. And, um, and so our sense of contentment, our sense of security, all of that is grounded in our relationship with Christ. Uh, it can't be grounded in our financial status or our material possessions or in what other people think about us. A true contentment and uh, confidence comes from knowing that the Lord is our helper and he will not leave us or forsake us. And when we fully embrace that truth, we can uh, let go of our fears, we can let go of our insecurities because we know that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Uh, we know that if God is for us, who can be against us? And so let's uh, seek our satisfaction in Christ and let's trust him to to guide us and to sustain us through the challenges and the trials that we face. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the security.
that has been secured through us, uh, for us through what Christ did on our behalf. Uh, we pray that that truth would sustain us, that it would permeate deeper into our souls, that uh, we might walk in greater levels of uh, confidence and security. Uh, I pray that you would help us to be intentional as we consider uh, how these truths might apply to our lives and uh, how we might overcome the, the vestiges of sin that remain in our flesh. Lord, as we continue our time together this morning, as we turn our attention to the Lord's Supper, uh, we pray that the gospel that is uh, revealed in this, this drama of the Lord's Supper would continue to nourish us and sustain us and uh, help us as we seek to apply these truths to our lives. And we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.